All right, thank you, Ariel, for the introduction. I'm really happy to be down here today in New York. Uh, my name is Phil Lombardi, and I come from Boston, Massachusetts, where I work for a small startup called DataWire.io. Uh, DataWire.io is helping customers uh, basically either migrate onto microservices, because they have monolithic applications right now, and they want to adopt microservices, or we are helping customers who have uh, basically adoption issues with microservices figure out new techniques to accelerate their business with uh, microservices on Kubernetes. And so like some of the stuff we're doing with Kubernetes is we have things like we are building around Lyft's Envoy um, for basically an API gateway. We are working on a provisioning system that wraps COPS and Terraform and actually handles doing some of the really nitty gritty work that actually is kind of left open to most engineers. And the thing I'm gonna talk about a little bit later is a tool called Telepresence, which allows you to basically bridge a local laptop into a Kubernetes cluster and have a shared environment that will not only give you network connectivity, but volumes and environment variables that are bridged between your local laptop and the Kubernetes cluster. So, what was so special about 2005? Uh, 2005 was kind of a rocking year culturally. We got YouTube, which I think all of us use every day probably, you know, to watch videos, cat videos, dog videos, music, whatever. Uh, we got Star Wars, Revenge of the Sith, which, you know, some of you may love, some of you may hate. My personal opinion is it's pretty awful. Hopefully uh, Disney reboots it. We got Guitar Hero, which I am sure everyone in this room has played and rocked out drunkenly at three in the morning pretending to be Jimi Hendrix with their friends. We also got American Idol, which is still actually pretty popular. And according to my coworker, we got Wedding Crashers, which was really popular uh, in 2005. Uh, I have seen it, but I didn't remember it came out in 2005. Also, in 2005, we got the Patriots, and it wouldn't be a Boston person down here in New York ringing on you guys uh, if I didn't mention that we collected one of our rings that year, and we, we trounced all over the NFL once again. But I digress. I am not here to talk to you about how awesome Tom Brady is in the Patriots. I am actually here to talk to you about what development was like in 2005. And so you can't start a conversation about what development was like in 2005 without basically talking about this, Ruby on Rails. <laughs> Ruby on Rails came out in 2005 and it kind of changed the way people built web services and web applications. You basically had this thing you could install right off their website, you could start editing code really quickly, you could save it and you got a reload and your changes were present. Ruby on Rails also really helped you basically uh, with things like database migrations, with you know, handling your models for definitions on the database side, and it made basically developing super simple. That super simplicity led to massive adoption, and that massive adoption led to companies building products really quickly, um, and then those companies grew and got bigger and bigger and bigger and realized that their little Ruby on Rails application they had built to you know, show their investors suddenly it was no longer a little Ruby on Rails application and was you know, several million lines of code and spanned many, many people on a single team or many teams, and there were conflicts with this. The paradigm of edit, save, reload still worked, but it wasn't scaling for them. So they started to adopt microservices. But developing microservices is really not as nice as coding on Ruby on Rails. Uh, you, for one, don't usually have a single framework that you're using, your company may want to try and enforce a single framework, it may say you all will build Ruby on Rails or Sinatra or you know, Play or whatever you know, language or paradigm or you know, framework you guys are working in, but usually it doesn't work out. Acquisitions happen, um, other engineers come on, someone wants to accelerate something and they pick a new technology, and suddenly you are dealing with a polyglot framework and you have services that are, you, know, you have to depend on other services. So, Developing microservices just really isn't as nice, and it's because of all the facts of a distributed system. You have just many, many components to work with. You have the situation of services depend on other services. You've got, you know, microservice one depends on microservice two. Microservice three is, you know, dependency of microservice two, and if you're really unlucky, you've ended up with microservice three depending on microservice one, um, which gives you that beautiful circular you know, dependency tree that we all do not ever want to see. You also have the problem of services end up depending on cloud resources. Or, you know, for those of you who are working in on-prem systems, that cloud, you know, just extrapolate it to your data center and whatever you're working with. You need a way to get access to that stuff in your local development environment. 
you may need to do that for a variety of reasons. For one, you know, if the data is big enough that you're working with and that you can't spin it up on your local machine, you'll need to connect over to the, you know, staging environment or the dev environment, which has pre-sanitized data, pre-aggregated data, whatever. And last, but your laptop is nowhere close to anything like a prod environment. Um, even if we try to simulate it, you're just never gonna get there. It will, you know, never run everything it needs to. You may not set up things the way they are in prod. You know, for example, you may not set up the HA active MQ cluster you actually need, but the prod guys are using. But, you know, you have something that's kind of like a standalone thing and it works. And, but point is, you end up with configuration drift or other types of drift that lead your laptop to not be at all like the thing you are running in production. So, what are we really to do? Well, this is kind of a, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the four different strategies we've seen, um, you know, our customers and our prospects using. They have kind of adopted, depending on where they are in the process of adopting, a bunch of different methodologies. There is everything from, you're going to run everything locally on your laptop and attempt to do that, and that works for some guys and some gals, but there are also companies that are doing fully remote development where basically everyone you know, SSHs into a shared development environment. All of these are valid strategies, they just have different trade-offs. So let's talk a little bit about the first one. Everyone is familiar with this coding locally, and coding locally basically means you're gonna spin up the entire stack for your microservices onto your local machine. And so most people start accomplishing this with say something like uh, Minikube as one of the tools, or Docker Compose. Uh, if you go back further, you know, to like 25, 27, people were using things like Vagrant to spin up virtual machines, and it worked pretty well. It is a solution um, for a small, small set of microservice users. You can basically spin up the whole thing, connect to it, you can change things as you need, you can kill things as you need to, and that works great for a certain set. So the cons of this setup are that you basically have to um, have the problem of one, you have to maintain all this stuff. You have a local stack and it's defined somewhere, hopefully in you know, GitHub or some other you know, source control mechanism, but it is a fully, it's, it's, it's defined for running on a laptop, not for running in production. So it has to be defined separately from your production setup, which means there's drift not only from your production setup, but there's also definitional drift as things change. You know, if you are working with a team of coworkers, they may be changing things, you may be changing things. You won't find out about that change until they tell you about it. So it's basically a uh, poll model for learning about changes in your infrastructure and what you're coding against. That's not great. Also, it just doesn't work for uh, as you get bigger. You have the problem of, well, five services I can probably run. I can probably even run 10. I might be able to even run 20 services. But 30, 40, 50 services, or when you get up into the you know, Netflix size death stars of thousands of services, and all of those things are JVM services, and they're eating up you know, between two and five gigabytes of RAM, good luck. Your laptop isn't gonna do it, and you can't buy a desktop on the market for a reasonable enough price that your company is gonna say, yes, we're gonna let you do that. <laughs> um, so that doesn't work. It also doesn't work as your team scales. So you get up to the situation where you have 50, 100, you know, 150 developers, and you have hundreds of services, um, you end up with people duplicating services because they don't know other services exist in the stack and they're trying to spin it up. Developers may be working on things in parallel that just don't exist. Anyways, point is, it doesn't really work. Um, and as I mentioned, like dev prod differences, that's just a continuing problem here. You also have the problem of what about data? So um, some of us are lucky enough to work on small data sets where we can synthesize them at will but many of you in this room probably work on, say, medical data, financial data, personal, you know, other kinds of personal identifiable data. You don't have the luxury often of either being able to spin it up or copy it over. You need to connect into some kind of controlled environment or have access to a massive cluster where the data is stored already. So, like, this just doesn't work for that case. Logically then, people end up in the, let's just run the business logic for what we're building locally, and we'll use cloud resources or on-prem you know, data center resources and connect everything. And so you end up doing something with, say, Minikube and Docker Compose once again, and you end up writing some custom shell scripts or Python or you wrap Terraform and Ansible or whatever 
and you end up you know, gluing it to what is running for data in the you know, Kubernetes cluster used for production or Amazon Web Services or you know, cloud platform for Google, Azure, whatever. But it's kind of a like, it's not any really any better than what you had with the previous setup. Yes, you have extracted away your data and you're running it over in the cloud, so like you can still get, you can get the benefits of having some of it offloaded, but you still need a way to basically run all those ex other services locally. So you still have the problem of setting this thing up. You still have the problem of configuration drift between dev prod or just dev and other dev. You have the, basically the problem of, you still need a more powerful laptop if you're gonna be running these things. Business services, even though they're not doing too much data storage or keeping things in memory long term, are probably still you know, eating up piles of memory, especially if they're once again a JVM service and they are uh, in the memory hogging realm of operations. And so, you know, you've kind of, you've solved a small problem, but you haven't actually solved the real problem with your system. And a lot of people do this. It's just the natural progression from the previous situation of I have, you know, all this stuff running locally, I need to do something with the heaviest and hardest things, move them off. Uh, and this is out of order because I forgot to change the order. Uh, so we had one and two and we're on four, but it's actually three. Um, so this option is kind of, I've heard some people use this. I've been told people use this. I have never actually done it this way, but it's basically the all remote development model, which is um, your computer actually acts basically as a dumb terminal. And when you want to work on something, you SSH into a remote system and you start coding on it. And it's really simple developer setup. Your developers basically need to be able to use SSH. They pop into a shared cluster and you can start hacking on things. That's great, but it has really bad tooling support. So good luck, you know, if you're using anything besides, you know, V or Emacs, you're going to find yourself struggling to set up IntelliJ IDE to work from your local machine over SSH connection. Um, you're gonna struggle probably getting your profiler, your debugger to work, or any of the other tools you really want to. And like, you know, it just has the problem of that it's particularly, um, particularly slow feedback cycle for changes. Like you can hack on things in the remote cluster, but it's not, it's not a guarantee that whatever your ops guys have set up um, is allowing you to just see those changes immediately. They may force you to still go through some kind of deployment pipeline just to see the change in that staging environment. On the other hand, it's a really easy thing for your operations team to actually set up. Um, they basically just have to copy prod and they can do that in a on-demand type fashion. You know, so every developer when they want an environment can basically get one by hitting some web service which will spin up the whole thing. Um, or they can do something like a nightly build and every developer gets a fresh new nightly copy every night at their request or you, know, you just let it run forever and ever and ever and it's a living system. But that's, uh, you know, simplifies ops problems. Doesn't actually simplify developers' problems. And like, you know, this problem, you have the other problem I didn't really touch on in the previous slide either was you can't code on this uh, locally. So, sorry, you can't code on this offline. So if you are like me and you travel around a lot, uh, either doing talks or you are going to customer sites, then you have the problem of when you're on an airplane and the Wi-Fi doesn't work, you are kind of, out of luck and your engineering manager will look at you disappointed, why didn't you commit things? Why didn't you fix things? Well, because there was no network connectivity, boss. Um, so that is a big problem for a certain segment of developer. But as I mentioned, it's really easy to set up. So all remote development is great. You can set up everything really easily, just copy your prod stack, have a way to SSH into it and go. And it's somewhat popular. There is a um, company in Boston called HubSpot, which is pretty large um, in the marketing and ad tech space that uses this paradigm for work. But what if we could get something a little bit better? What if we could get something where we work on our one service locally and all the other services are remote? And so like there are a number of ways people have actually tried to do this in the past. It's, you know, people would use OpenVPN, people would use kubectl's port forward mechanisms. Uh, these are all techniques like you can use, and I'm gonna talk a little bit in a minute about this telepresence thing that, you know, it's an open source project we've been working on at DataWire, but they're all kind of, it, it's, the idea is you have this remote cluster already available. 
don't try and force everything to go through it. Basically bridge the necessary things people need over into your local environment so you can still use all your friendly local environment tools. You can still code as if you're local. You can see changes immediately as if you were hacking on it locally. The idea is basically get back to that um, Rails kind of edit, save, reload, see the change. And the added benefit, since you're working in a shared cluster and you're working with a team, you can edit, save, reload, and all your coworkers will see that change as well, which I'm not suggesting you do this for prod. That would be crazy. But it's an awesome experience if you're a developer and you're working on a team and you're working on like a brand new prototype for a feature. So I kind of put up all these things the way to do this. These are kind of the differences between the different technologies. Like people have tried to do this a little bit with the OpenVPN. And OpenVPN is you know, secure communication. And it's a bi-directional network. So you can talk to things in the Kubernetes cluster. And you can also talk to things. The Kubernetes cluster can talk to stuff that is running on your laptop. But it has the, high pro the big problem of basically open VPN or really any VPN is a nightmare to configure and get actually running. And then there's also no support for basically any of the Kubernetes you know, primitives that you're used to using, like volumes or environment variables. So it's really only for networking. Similarly, we have this kubectl port forward mechanism. And it's easy to set up and use with a small number of services. It gets a little bit more tedious if you have lots and lots of services that you want to port forward for, but you can do it. You can write some scripts around it. You can make it happen. Um, but it's unidirectional. It's your laptop or your desktop over to Kubernetes. It is not a bi-directional link, so you, know, you cannot have a developer on another laptop talk to you because it's talking through Kubernetes and it's, your service is represented inside of that Kubernetes cluster as if it was right there. And so it has also, for that fault, no proxy ability for uh, Kubernetes volumes or environment variables. And then there's this telepresence thing, which we've been building, which is bi-directional networking. So you can talk to the Kubernetes cluster. Kubernetes cluster can talk back to you. You have the ability, it's really easy to set up and use, which I guess is completely subjective, but I promise it's actually not that bad. Um, and it's got the ability to proxy Kubernetes environment variables and volumes across, you know, from the Kubernetes cluster into your development environment. So let's talk about that single service local or, you know, end services local that you're hacking on and all the other services remote. You still get to use your local dev tools, which if you are using anything more sophisticated than a text editor is awesome. You still get to have the benefit of um, a fast feedback cycle. You still have the simple developer setup, and it's really easy for a developer to set this up. It's open up a text editor, start working, open up telepresence, start working, or open up, if you're gonna use the other two technologies, open up the connection for OpenVPN, or open up the kubectl uh, port forward, sorry. It's really scalable, so you're not actually going to have to host any of these things on your laptop, except for the service you're working on. All that other stuff is running off in the remote cluster. And it's, uh, it's, it's just kind of a, it's a more realistic environment than anything you're going to get otherwise. Uh, and why is it more realistic? Well, because you can basically have your operation team copy prod every night or for you on demand or whatever. And so you're actually coding against what would be a very realistic prod environment. And, but you know, there's still the drawback of can't code offline and you can't really, uh, it is complicated for ops to set up in the sense that if they want to do the more advanced thing of bi-directional networking with also the Kubernetes proxying stuff for environment variables and volumes, they need to figure that out. And they also need to figure it out in a way so that if you want to share it between n number of team members on your team, that's on them to figure out. And so it's not really like, it's not, it's not, um, it's not to say it's hard for them to do from a setting up the environment, it's hard to do from a let's get it so it's a good developer experience. So, that's the kind of the four strategies that exist. Uh, there's this kind of handy eye chart that I've put out here, which has a bunch of subjective little, little uh, hexagons on it about where like these things kind of help out. You've obviously got, you know, run system locally is awesome for fast feedback cycles, but it has its, its issues with uh, low setup maintenance and, you know, realism and scalability. Um, you kind of have the, what you get to next, which is the run, you know, some things local, business logic all the, all the business logic locally and all the you know, data services in the cloud and that solves and makes things a little bit better but you get a kind of worse fast feedback cycle. 
Um, you can do the single service local, all other services remote, which is pretty good. It's got great scalability. Um, it's got okay you know, feedback cycle. Low setup is for developers. Uh, maintenance is kind of a, is still just a sunk cost no matter what for operations since they have to maintain prod. And then there's the all remote development which has a poor feedback cycle but has probably the best features across the board for realism, uh, low setup, and scalability for everything else. Anyways, I kinda wanna talk a little bit more about this single service local, all other services remote option. So we talked and we said like it's a mostly realistic environment and it's complicated for ops to set up. And so what if I told you you can get basically a perfectly realistic environment and you could get it so that your operations team didn't have to think at all about how they're going to handle making it a, a solution that you can basically hack on with all your developers in a way that you can expose your Kubernetes cluster to your local machine easily and your local machine is exposed to the Kubernetes cluster easily. And you can share that with your entire team. Cool, wouldn't it be? Yes. So we got this thing called telepresence, which we built as a synthesis of a lot of the things people have been asking for. Um, it's basically telepresence becomes a pod that runs in lieu of the pod that your actual service would be on the Kubernetes cluster. So like say you write a deployment manifest, instead of actually having a Docker image for the service you're actually gonna run, you basically spin up this telepresence pod instead. And what telepresence does is it actually proxies all the network requests, all the environment variables, all the variables, all the volumes that are actually connected for that deployment over to your local client. And so basically when you're actually coding, you are coding locally on your file system. You are editing files on your file system and everything else is seamlessly occurring uh, behind the scenes. So like you could even connect up a cloud load balancer in a way so that when you have like a ELB, the traffic from that ELB will end up on your laptop. And it's open source. And it's kind of, this is a, this is a kind of a poor diagram that I hacked together 30 minutes before this uh, presentation because my coworker was like, you gotta have something to show like how this actually works. Um, there's two proxies. There's a SOX proxy and it's kind of being facilitated by this thing called the Tor SOX library, um, which is connecting, it's basically intercepting basically socket API calls, low level system socket API calls and handling like a whole bunch of stuff proxying over to this telepresence container which is handling some more nitty gritty details. I could talk more about that, but I guarantee you the webpage for Telepresence actually does a better job explaining it than I can do in person and you know orally. So it's, it has diagrams and stuff for the people who are really technically curious. So I highly recommend checking that out. Let me do, I'm gonna do a little bit of a demo actually. So I have got a Kubernetes cluster spun up for this thing here. So. Make sure I'm actually connected. Cool, so I spun up this Kubernetes cluster earlier today for doing this demo. And so I'm gonna show you right now that it's got a couple things running on it. It's got, um, you know, got a couple services. Um, you're gonna see there's, uh, shoot, sorry. No, I'm gonna use my left, use my mouse. And I'm also gonna sit down because it's easier to do this while sitting down. So. How does this actually work up there? You guys see, you want me to zoom in? Does that help? Uh, okay, maybe a computer doesn't want to zoom in. Uh, why is it not want to do? All right, fascinating. We'll do it with good old, is that better? Everyone can see now? Awesome, all right, so Got a couple services, I got this hello world service, I got a counter service, which is basically just doing an increment of a bunch of, basically a Redis thing, we got Redis running. Redis and the count server are running on the Kubernetes cluster themselves. And I'm gonna show you, like, there's nothing, there's no magic going on in any of these things. Um, count serve is going to look like, there's no magic here. It's just making a Redis connection, opening it up to the Redis that's running on the Kubernetes cluster right next to it. And so that's cool. It's also, we're gonna show you the hello script. Uh, oops, where am I? Sorry guys. There's no magic in here at all either. It's making a request to the count serve, but 
the hello thing is actually not running, the hello service is actually not running on this Kubernetes cluster. It's actually not running anywhere right now. The only thing that's running is going to be the um, telepresence proxy. So let's actually describe deployment for hello world. So it's actually, it's not what I want to show you. Uh, no, I don't want to do. Do, do, do. I will show you really what's going on. All right, ignore all this PGSQL stuff. Uh, this thing here, this data wire telepresence KNS, you know, with a version number after it, that is the proxy that's running on the Kubernetes cluster. So if you were to think about how you were previously working on this hello world service, you may be spinning up a hello world, you know, data wire slash hello Docker image. That gets replaced. You basically comment that out, you put this in, this data wire telepresence KNS 042 in, and you go. And so I'm gonna show you what that actually turns into. You do this telepresence, you tell it what deployment it's gonna use, so we're gonna use the hello world deployment. We're gonna expose port 8080, and it's going to drop us into a shell that is transparently got all this stuff uh, going on behind the scenes. All right, so the shell's booted up. I'm actually now part of the cluster. Uh, if I do it env, you're going to see that there are a number of Kubernetes uh, variables actually dumped into this. Um, you'll see like things like the hello service port, Kubernetes ports, all that stuff. That's all coming from the cluster itself. I'm now going to start actually hacking on, um, you know, the Python app. Let me boot it up. Oop, sorry. All right, there we go. All right, so that little Python app is written in Flask. Um, it should be pretty easy for us to uh, basically edit it in a minute. But so, assuming the load balancer has picked this up. Do, that's not what I want to see. All right, cool. We're up and running, and it's running locally. Um, but has the load balancer picked it up? It should. Uh, bum, bum, bum. Yes. So that is actually being basically that's a that New York C cube D six E is actually going through a load balancer to my local laptop. So it's going through an ELB on Amazon. It is routing through Kubernetes and into my laptop. Let's change the code for hello to do something with some of those services that we were actually uh, looking at before. So we're gonna hack on hello.py. Not hello.py. So we've got this, uh, that count serve, which basically just increments a number for every time it comes in. Let's uncomment this code and actually use it. That, remember that count service is actually running on the cluster. So, count that out. And we'll see that, um, you know, Flask automatically reloaded the code for me because it changed. And I can now do this. And this request number eight, I have received. That is showing you that I can edit that code locally on my machine it is proxying everything over to my code that is running on my machine. I am utilizing a service on the Kubernetes cluster. So I'm utilizing the Kubernetes, uh, the counter service that I wrote earlier. And it's also utilizing a Redis database in the back end on that counter service. So pretty cool. We could actually, like, we could do more hacking here, but I'm not gonna, not gonna burn out everyone's time. Uh, kind of flipping back over to this presentation. Hopefully it's not. Uh, yeah, anyways, so a little bit more about this implementation. How are we actually proxying this using this network? So on Linux, we basically hook into LD preload, and on Mac OS, we basically hook into the Dildy insert libraries, and they're dynamic linker features that allow you to inject new libraries and new library code into any binary that's running. That new library can then override system and library calls, and so what we actually use is this library called Torsox to intercept all the socket library calls that are coming out of your system and change them up and route them over to the proxy. And then proxy, the volumes, which I didn't show right now, um, are basically actually being handled by this tool called SSHFS underneath the scenes, and environmental, environmental, sorry, environment variables are really easy because you just copy them over. There's no, there's no real magic there. Anyways, uh, thank you for your time tonight. 
Um, please check out telepresence.io. Um, you can email me at plombardi at datoio, or you can hit me at the, uh, on Twitter as the Big Lombowski, which I probably should have put on here. Um, if anyone wants cool stickers, also, I have stickers. So if you want uh, the cool sticker of a, where is it? Here it is. We have these little Blackbird dudes with um, t basically VR goggles on that I am happy to hand out. And you can plaster them all over, and I hope to see them all over New York City because that'd be awesome. Anyways, thanks, guys. Questions? Yeah, absolutely. Questions? Hold that. So during a development process, is, uh, is the work that gets reloaded tied to a directory, or does it anywhere on the file system you can make any changes? And any, so you can do any, like, so it's, the question was basically when you are hacking on something on your machine and it's tied to the local file system at all, and so is it tied to a directory, is it tied to a particular file? The answer is no. So it's up to you and whatever tool you're using. So I used Flask right here, which has an automatic reload mechanism. So when you change the file, it sees a change and then reloads it and your code is basically hot swapped. That would not work, say, for a Java developer who needs to do a recompile. So like you'd have to stop the thing, recompile, restart, but it would just seamlessly recover afterwards. So like it wouldn't, it would, it's not nearly as smooth unless you had something that was doing like dynamic you know, class reloading, but same idea. And so it's not tied to any particular directory layout or any particular you know, process or any implementations like that. You can do whatever you want. It could be a text file. You could have done something with like you know, uh, Netcat and Echo and a file if you really wanted to and called it a day. Um, does that answer the question? Awesome. Is it just SSH to the cluster? It's, uh, no, it's a, this, oh. So the question was, is it just SSH from your local machine into the cluster? No, it's, we're intercepting socket, low level operating system socket calls by injecting in this TorSox library and then changing things. I could actually, I, I cannot actually tell you more about that. The guy who actually wrote the code for this isn't here tonight. He was originally gonna do this presentation, but he had personal things that came up. So I'm doing this. If you go to the website, it explains a little bit what's, more about what's going on in detail. But I can also put you in touch with him if you would like, and you can have a full on conversation with him about what's going on underneath the covers. Is there any limit to what you can project secret wise from the cluster onto your local service? Sorry? Uh, secrets from other namespaces. So if you're, if you're running a service in a certain namespace, can you, do you have access to secrets from other namespaces? We have access to what's in the namespace. Uh, are, if you want more filtering, that we can take a feature request. Um, or if you want more expansive, like you can see everything, I guess we can also take a feature request for that. Um, so yeah, it's on GitHub. Uh, just check it out, open an issue, and we'll, we'll work on it. Thanks. No problem. Just a quick question. Is the DNS, uh, does it like, does it, pre <clears throat> does it use the Kubernetes DNS and everything? Yes, it uses the Kubernetes DNS. Okay, so if I have multiple deployments in different namespaces, depending on which shell, it uses the different It uses the correct order. one, yep. Okay. Are there any uh, bugs or gotchas? We've tried to do transparent proxying of, say, Java before, and it doesn't use standard system calls for, um, for DNS, for instance. It tries to do its own. So it's alpha software. There's or... always bugs and issues that we have not run into yet. Uh, but we are happy to work with you. If you have, like, if you have an implementation that you already tried out, or you have some test cases that you would like us to actually go through, um, and you want to open an issue on the GitHub repo, we will be happy to work with you and go through those issues and see if, like, if we can either we've already solved them, or if there's something we need to work around. Like, happy to work with you on it. Uh, is it one person dev environment, or it's a full collaborative environment? This setup. So it's a full Kubernetes environment. So is, is the question? Um, I mean, is it possible to have multiple proxies to, dif to different uh, services? So each developer on his own laptop working on different service in yes. the same Kubernetes So every cluster. developer could have their own proxy into this Kubernetes cluster. So it's a, you could have a fully on shared Kubernetes cluster. And if someone takes his laptop away, basically the service dies. It's like a service dying, exactly. Okay. So it's a way of simulating a a failure case, I guess. <laughs> don't use it in production. I really don't recommend using it in production. <laughs>
Cool. Anything else? All right. Awesome. Thank you very much, Phil. Thanks for your time, guys.